streaming. Okay. <clears throat> Am I actually appearing? Yes. Wrong audio. Okay, I think that's working. Excellent. Excellent day. All right, um, I'll just wait a minute and see if anyone shows up on chat. So I can say hello. Hello from Shane. Hello from Anton. Super Megabytes. How is the audio and um, video? Can you read the text? Can you hear my voice okay? Am I too quiet? <clears throat> Stellar. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. How's everyone getting on with the uh, being locked in the house thing for weeks? <clears throat> I thought this might be a good opportunity to, while everyone's stuck at home, do some, hey, I've never done C programming before, or I've never done programming at all before. What's it all about? So I thought, why not? I do this all the time. I can easily show people how to do this stuff. <clears throat> I have a rough plan, um, which I can refer to shortly. Best thing ever. Excellent. <laughs> Good for some, but I think the, the lack of social life is a bit of a bummer. Um, <clears throat> I'll just I'll wait a few minutes to see if other people turn up before I start. I haven't streamed for ages, and I've just got the OBS app. I've got the Twitch app. I don't know if it's worth even opening that. I don't know what it really does. Um, so feel free to throw some pointers at me. Um, I may well screw this up at some point. And for some reason on OBS, the little um, streaming app, the text is unbelievably tiny, so I can't really see it. <laughs> so I may click the wrong button at some point. I don't know what's going on there. Um, oh, thanks, Jane. Um, that's pretty much it. <clears throat> so my plan for this is not to do like a one hour lecture, do a short tutorial. Let's just start coding. This is how you're gonna start programming. That's my idea. <clears throat> Um, I don't want to get into any details of, of fancy stuff or anything like that. It's like, let's go. Um, so I'll, we'll wait a few minutes. <clears throat> I don't know if I can see in OBS how many people are actually connected or not. Users in chat? Okay, we've got a few. Hello, Game Dev Kevin, D. Sua, Claire, Norflip, Pectrek, and Varstal. <clears throat> okay, so my rough plan is to do uh, anyway. Um, I, what I was really thinking of is um, I've got friends that have their kids at home because schools are closed. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe you've got everyone in that generation plays all sorts of video games has 10 devices, they're connected to every sort of internet imaginable, and they have no idea how to make video games, but they kind of would like to be a streamer or a video game developer or something. So what I was thinking was, when I was inspired by stuff like that, I had no idea where to start. And I think that's kind of the case. Um, something that's kind of interesting is the generation before me, so people who started programming in the 80s, early 90s, or even the 70s, um, that there were really quite different computers back then. So much more kit set variety and shipped with manuals that told you how to start. Sometimes you had to actually solder them together yourself. They were targeted at students a lot of the time or hobbyists and they shipped with programming manuals and they told you how to make software right from the beginning. So um, when I started, when I first got a computer or access to a computer, it was um, IBM compatibles and early Macs. And that was the generation of um, consumer computers where it was really all about, you're a consumer now, you're not a hobbyist, forget about it. You're not, hello, Alien01. Um, you're not a, a, um, a programmer, you're just gonna buy software. So 
I think that's carried on and now you have everyone has a console at home. You can't even do anything on it if you want to. And I think that's kind of a shame. So I think that distance from learning how to get started is even further away than it was when I started. Um, so my idea is let's just do a quick and simple introduction. And um, at the moment I am uh, writing a book with my friend Katja called Professional, the current title is Professional Programming Tools for C and C++. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to do a little tutorial in C, how to make a simple program. Here's a few basic concepts. Um, and I think that's kind of a nice way to go um, because it's probably the language I've used the most in my career. Um, Nintendo Switch does have a game dev app that you can code in. I think it's called Fuse. I haven't got a Switch or even seen a Switch yet, so that's good to hear. Um, yeah, I think when you start programming, any language is fine to start with. I've recently had a go at Go, the language, um, to brush up. Uh, it's an interesting programming language and really easy to get started, really easy to start with Python, um, really easy to start with JavaScript, and then you can do stuff on a web page. So I don't think it matters. But I think C is really interesting for me because it's topical to something I've been doing lately. Um, and it's what they call the language of Unix. So it's the Unix operating system was like really a fundamental operating system that changed everything. And you're almost certainly using a device or devices that have a system based on Unix now. And all of those are almost certainly written largely with C. Um, so it's absolutely a language that NDS coding for Switch should be fun. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's great for operating systems. It's a basic computer science language. It's where I started learning programming. Um, and in the early 2000s, we were saying, why are we doing this? All the other universities are learning Java. That's the new hotness. We should be doing like Java. That's where all the jobs are now, right? And we questioned it at the time, but in retrospect, I think it was a great language to start with because it's very, very simple. Um, and it's very close to the computer architecture, the hardware that you're actually going to be running your programs on. So I think we got an advantage actually of the people who learned Java in the beginning because it's not as simple. It's a more abstract computer programming language. Um, and so I think it's really great to spend some time, it doesn't matter if it's the first language you use or not, some time using C because you're going to work with memory. You're gonna work with very simple instructions that are very, very close to what the computer will actually execute um, at the end of the day. And it's super performant and there's loads of jobs still with C and it's derivative languages, C++, Objective-C, they're all very, very similar. So once you've learned C, you can do any of these other things, no problem. <clears throat> anyway, that's enough uh, blabbering. Uh, I think we can actually get started with making something with the C programming language. Um, I, I think the first real concept you need to understand is that um, computer programming languages are not something that the computer understands at all. They're a human language, not a computer language. So that's a really key point that's not obvious when you're first hearing about computer programming. They're a human language. They're for your benefit. They're a way of um, a notation system for formulating logic or so writing lines of logic that you can understand. Um, the computer actually executes something called machine code. Um, and machine code and your C programming language or your Go programming, they're not the same thing. So there's actually a stage that you need to go through to turn your computer programming um, or your uh, uh, code written in C or written in Go or written in, in whatever uh, into something the computer understands and will actually run instructions on the computer. And for C, there's a tool called a compiler. So that's actually a separate program. Um, and I think a good first step is we're going to download a compiler. And I think the best baseline starting point across any system that you're working on is grab GCC if you can. That's the GNU compiler collection. Um, and if you're on, um, so that's GCC, and I'm just going to make a point there. Um, C is a human language, not a computer language. Uh, computers understand machine code. And then we have this idea that um, C is compiled into machine code. So you write in C, you're not going to understand machine code. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to be specific to your computer. So we'll use a compiler. So we're going to download a compiler. 
Step one. Uh, bytecode, I think, can refer to um, several different things. Um, so I think if you're going to be specific to um, actual instructions that run on a CPU, that's um, um, your computer's core processor, um, <clears throat> it's going to be machine code is your specific term. So I think, I think bytecode can be a variety of things you compile or build for different machines. <clears throat> That may include, I'm not sure, that may include machine code. Um, I'm not a compiler person, so I don't know the exact definitions of these things. Um, so I'm, I would describe myself mostly as a computer graphics um, programmer. Um, so I'm not a total expert in languages, language design, but I know how to get you started. <clears throat> okay, so step one, download a compiler. GCC is the uh, GNU compiler collection. And most operating systems, you can get GCC. And you should use GCC at some point if you're using C. Hello, Python. Python, no. Python's not quite the same as Python. <clears throat> um, OK, the other, you, there's a variety of different compilers, though. There's, you've got options. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Um, so if you're on a Linux system, and I think if you do have a Linux system or access to one, these days, building software is going to be easier to do on Linux. Um, so if you've got a Linux operating system of some sort, um, the command you want to type to install GNU and everything else GNU needs to work is uh, sudo, which is super user do, um, apt install. Uh, there's a package in the repository of software. In, uh, this is, so this is going to be relevant for Ubuntu or Debian or uh, Mint um, build essential. Um, other Linux distributions will have different commands. If you just go clicking through the main menu, you'll find a software installer that will have a list of stuff you can install. And you will find the package that has GCC in it. But usually it's called Build Essential. So that will be relevant for uh, Ubuntu. I think most people are using if you've got a Linux. Um, and I have a little Ubuntu here. And I think I've already installed GCC on it. So if I just repeat that command. Um, and you can actually type tab. You can partially complete stuff in the Linux terminal and hit tab, and it'll. If there's something obvious there to finish it off, it'll find it for you. <clears throat> um, and that's how you install stuff. And then you use your user password, and if you have permission to install stuff, it'll do it. I think it's already there, so it hasn't done anything. Otherwise, you'd see a little progress indicator there. So if I now type in GCC and then go dash dash version, so I'm giving a flag to GCC. So this is the Linux terminal. It should tell me, yes, GCC version 7.5 is installed. Um, and if I just type in GCC, it'll say, hey, that's OK, but you haven't given me any files to compile, so I'm not doing nothing. Um, so that's OK. We have a Linux there that has GCC. If you're running a Windows, um, you've got a bunch of options, actually. You could go to. Um, download Microsoft's full-blown integrated development environment. That's called Visual Studio, and that has a C compiler in it. You can go look that up and install it. It's a big, hefty install. But you can, and you should be able to find a free version of that called Community. You don't need all that stuff, though. So that's, that's an option. You should do it at some point if you're on Windows and um, also interested in programming. Um, but if you want to install GCC, you can. It used to be really easy to do, and for a few years it was a nightmare. Um, but there's a really nice, and I've got a website over here, there's a really nice package that includes GCC that you can find on newen.net slash mingw. Um, I don't know if you guys can read that. <clears throat> but this is fantastic. So what this will do is it will, you've got a little package you can download there. And that will set everything up you need. And there's an installer for it. Or you can just, I think, download it as a zip file and unzip it somewhere. Um, so it doesn't need to tie into everything. And if you go ahead and download one of these packages and set it up, um, I think by default, um, let me just grab my computers explorer. So if you go to your C drive, it'll, I think by default, wants to put it directly in the C drive. Uh, yes, I'm using C for the tutorial. Welcome every release. I'm uh, the, the first step is installing a compiler. I just blabbered for ages. 
about why C is an interesting language to use. You can use anything um, when you start programming. I found Go really easy to get started with. Um, so on Windows, Visual Studio is like your default. It's a big hefty thing though. You can install GCC and I'm gonna use GCC on Windows. Um, if you grab GCC from this MinGW package from this particular website, it's really nice and clean and well-maintained. It will stick it in your C drive in a folder there. And then within that, if you read through the instructions on the website, it'll tell you you've got a couple of these batch files you can run um, that if you, if you open that, it'll open a terminal for you. And if you've never used a terminal before, you need to know what a terminal is and how you can use it. Um, and it's quite straightforward. So uh, in the old days, you kind of had to use a terminal um, with MS-DOS, which was Microsoft's original operating system before Windows was a thing. Um, and you type in commands rather than clicking through folders and things. Um, <clears throat> So this is a directory listing we've got here. It's saying we're on the C drive. Within the C drive, we're inside a folder called MinGW, and we have a flashing prompt that says you can type stuff in. Um, so there are a bunch of built-in commands. If you want to see what's in a folder on Windows, you can type in dir for list directory, and it'll tell you. And you can see this kind of matches up here with the Explorer view. So we have a folder called bin, include, lib, and they match up there. So it's giving you that same sort of information. Um, <clears throat> and um, what this means is if you've run this little batch file, it sets up an, a terminal environment and opens that for you where you can type in, as if, as we were just doing on Windows there, you can type in GCC and it works. Um, and this is all you need actually. So once you've downloaded that and set it up, you can run that batch file and you're ready to go. Um, <clears throat> the only thing you might want to do is run it from without using this terminal, run it from any other terminal from any folder. Um, so what I prefer to do, and if you actually navigate around in here, you'll see a bunch of files. And this will come in interesting, this will be interesting for you later. Um, so we've got a folder here called bin, and bin is short for binary, and it has all of the programs and binary files in there. So um, everything that you can run as a program is typically a built or a compiled binary file. Um, so they're all in this subfolder called bin. And you'll notice in here, this one called gcc.exe. And if you don't see the .exe on there on Windows, it's worth going to your view menu and making sure you've got this button here clicked on. So I think by default on most Windows, it's not on. And you wanna turn that on so you can tell what, explicitly see what type each file is. So I could see gcc is a .exe, which means on Windows, that means it's an executable file, you can run it. Um, and with these type of files, it's not going to really do much for us if we just click on them. It'll run it, but it's not really telling us anything. So they're really intended to be run from the command line where they'll print out information for you like it just did there um, <clears throat> from our little terminal. So actually typing that in in the terminal, GCC, that's the same as clicking on it. However, we get this interesting printed out information that the program has told us, hey, I can't find any input files. <clears throat> Okay, anyway, I'd like to be able to not have to open that batch file. I want to run it from everywhere. So if you click up here in your, uh, whoops, if you click up here in your um, address bar, you can see that address. I'm just going to copy paste that. And if I go to my computer icon there and right click on that and go properties, and then if you dig around here deep enough, you'll find it. So I think advanced system properties. Uh, and then environment variables, what I'm trying to do is add that particular folder um, to my command path. So I've got a bunch of stuff in here. These are all built in system variables. And there's one here called path. And this is something you would have to do all the time in the old days, but now people probably don't even know this is here. Um, <clears throat> and actually I've already added it here, but if you, if you don't have that, um, you can actually just paste your path in um, and go okay and you're done. <clears throat> and what that means is if you open a new terminal from anywhere, so um, actually if you go, how do we do this now? Um, oh, you can just type in from the start menu these days, can't you? Or hit the uh, search bar. So if I type in CMD, it'll run the old Windows terminal, which is fine. And if I type in GCC now, it should just work because I've added that particular folder to my 
path. And it will look, whenever I type something in, if it's not already a command that the terminal knows about, it will go and look in that list of paths and try and run it from there. Um, and that's what I want. I want to be able to do that from anywhere, and I'll show you why a little bit later on. So if you're setting up your compiler on Windows, I think this is the easiest, simplest thing to do that doesn't use Visual Studio. Go ahead and do both. Have a play around. Um, on, does anyone have any questions about that so far, actually, before I carry on with other setup? <clears throat> if you're on, on Mac OS, if you're running a Mac, that what you need to do is um, go into your app store and install an app called Xcode. And that's a free, uh, the same sort of thing as Visual Studio on Windows. It's the Apple equivalent, and it's an integrated development environment, an IDE for Apple systems. And that will have the same sort of stuff. It has a C compiler, but it won't install GCC. What it'll install is a similar compiler called Clang. So on Mac OS, um, install Xcode app via the App Store to get Clang compiler. Um, oops. And you can, Clang's kind of the same as GCC. It has the same interface. You can use it the same way. You can install it on Windows too, and you can install it on Linux. I probably already have it installed here. I do. You can see it said the same thing. So it's expecting the same kind of input. Uh, can I just use my regular MinGW64 and install it there? Um, yes, you can use the regular, the older versions of MinGW packages from elsewhere will still work. Yes. I found this one um, to just be a little bit tidier and better maintained and self-contained. The older MinGW setups were a bit of a mess to install things, I found. So if you're happy enough with the old one, absolutely, that's fine. Um, if you're on, sorry, if I go back to my Linux here, if you want to install Clang and GCC on Linux, it's sudo apt install Clang, I believe, on Ubuntu. Yes, and that will give you Clang as well. And if you type in Clang dash dash version, it'll tell you which version is installed. And so it's really helpful to have a few compilers, actually, as you will find later on when you get into it. But to begin with, install whatever is easiest. It doesn't matter, actually. So. On Linux, I guess a nice default is GCC. On um, Apple, you will have the same kind of interface, but you'll be using Clang instead. Um, and on Windows, you can use MinGW GCC. If you really can't be bothered with that command line stuff, you can use Visual Studio instead. Um, <clears throat> all of those are fine. <clears throat> OK. Okay, so we, we um, yeah, so it's it's important to know what a terminal is, and if if you're a Mac OS person, you may not actually have used the terminal before, but it turns out now I'm not streaming on a Mac, so I can't show you. Um, what you've got on Mac that's great is you if you go digging around in your um, application submenus, you will find the terminal on Mac, and it will do exactly the same thing as I've got open here. Um, it's much closer to a Linux environment. You have the same kind of commands. So I showed you on Windows on, on Windows terminals. So you, have, you actually have two terminals in Windows, or at least two. I think there's a new one as well. So you have CMD and you have PowerShell. Um, and these should be built in. Um, so if you type in dir on these, it'll list a directory. On Linux, which is a Unix-based thing, so you can use the Unix commands instead. So you don't have dir is not the, the default um, directory listing, it's ls. So there's nothing in this folder. Um, but Mac will have the same thing. So it's based on uh, a, the underlying system is, I think, OpenBSD. So it has a terminal that's almost identical to a Linux terminal. You will type in ls to list your directory. You can type in, after you install Xcode, um, type in uh, clang and see what happens. It should show you something like this. Then you're ready to go. <clears throat> OK, so um, an interesting thing to note is that um, when you're typing in code in C, as in many other languages, actually, uh, it's just plain text. So it's just a plain text file you need. You can use a plain text editor to write your C code. Notepad on Windows, absolutely fine. That will work fine. Um, I'm using, I think, my favorite text editor, 
for writing code these days is um, a little program called Visual Studio Code. It's not the same thing as Microsoft Visual Studio. I don't know why they have a similar name. It's very confusing. Um, but Visual Studio Code is this thing I have open right now. Um, and it's just a very simple text editor. And if you're writing code in a particular programming language, it has lots of little help, helpers and things. And uh, it also has, as you might be able to see down the bottom, an integrated terminal, which is kind of handy if you want to do things like type in GCC um, to try and compile your code straight away. You can do that. So it's kind of nice. <clears throat> But people have personal preferences about these things. I think every second programmer prefers a different setup. So have a play around. If you like Visual Studio Code, um, it'll run on every operating system. It's an open source Microsoft endeavor that's pretty niche um, and kind of unheard of from old Microsoft. But if you're on, I, I use it on Mac, on Linux, and on Windows. Um, and if you're working with C and C++, you'll see on the left here, there's a bunch of little tab buttons. Um, and the second to last one there with the little building blocks um, is the extensions tab. And you can install, um, if you search in this little search bar and type in C slash C++, it, there is an extension you can install made by Microsoft. Um, that's really quite nice. And you can install that. And then when you're working on C code, it'll add nice highlighting. Um, It'll know what to expect from C, and it'll help with inter inter integrations with different tools you might want to use with it. Um, so that's pretty neat. But none of this really matters. You can absolutely do any of this in a plain text file. So all you're really looking at here is a text editor. Um, so to get started, what I did was I made an empty folder. I have this text file in it for my plan for today, but you can ignore that. And, and all you want to do is make a new text file, actually. A plain text document, not a rich text document. So if you're using a text editor, when you go to save your first program in C, do not save it in rich text format. Things will get confused by that. You just want to save it as plain text. Um, so I'm going to start by, so this is, you can call it anything you want. And actually you can see it's a .txt. So remember I turned this on in Windows, file name extension, so I can see what type of document I'm working with. Um, and I'm going to rename that. And I'm going to call it your typical um, basic starter file for any C program is called main.c. So, and it's updated the icon there because it thinks it knows what uh, C is in the Explorer. Um, all it is is a plain text file. So keep that in mind. And I've just given it a .c extension. It doesn't mean anything, actually. Um, it's just a convenience to remind me that I'm looking at some code. Um, <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to do uh, type out what your basic, um, and I'm actually going to show you uh, a little bit later that it is a plain text document uh, by opening it in Notepad. But I'm going to write out a very simple C program to show you the basic structure of your most simple program you can write in C. Um, and it looks like this. So we're going to start off with this strange symbol, which uh, in uh, proper English is called hash, and in American English is called pound. Um, and then type include, and then open angle bracket. And never mind this stuff popping up. That's something uh, Visual Studio Code is doing to try and be helpful, and it's not really helpful. Um, so just ignore that. And you can see it's actually highlighting things in color. So it's recognized what hash is in when I'm running C code. And when I've opened the angle bracket, it's actually made it red. Um, so that's kind of handy um, when you're working on new things. Um, to give give an at a glance look, I don't really like it's called syntax highlighting. I don't really like it, but most programmers like having this here as a little peace of mind that they've typed things in the right way. Um, so hash includes space, open angle bracket, and then stdio.h, and then close angle bracket. So we have this concept of opening and closing brackets of different sorts in programming languages. So this seems like a crazy little command at the moment. We'll come back to that later, actually. Let's just assume that it has to be there for now. Um, and then we get to um, <clears throat> the, the, the entry point, it's called, of our program. So this has a fixed format. So this has to be there somewhere in your program. So I'm going to type in int space main open parentheses. So this is the second type of brackets we're using. Um, I'm not going to put anything in there. 
uh, and then space again, and then open curly brackets. And you can see it's Visual Studio Code has jumped in and closed it for me as well. So it's assuming I want to have the closing curly bracket or brace as well. So we've got one, two, three different types of opening and closing of brackets and braces there. Uh, and then inside here, I'm not going to put much. Uh, I'm going to write a name of a special uh, function called printf. <clears throat> and then once again, open and close parentheses. So if you're working in a notepad or something, you absolutely can just type this in. Um, and then I'm going to open and close quotation marks. And within the quotation marks, I'm going to write capital H for hello, comma, world, exclamation mark, backslash, N. Uh, and at the end of this here, after the closing parentheses, which is the name of these round brackets, I'm going to put a semicolon. And that's the first line that will execute in my program. <clears throat> and I'll explain all of this in a minute. Um, and then after that, I'm going to finish this off by typing return zero semicolon again. So this is your most simple, uh, and then save that file actually. Um, file save. And this is your most simple. C program. This is a complete working C program. It doesn't do anything yet because it's just a text document, but that is absolutely C code and I believe that's going to work. <clears throat> and where is my little folder? Okay, so I'm going to actually open this in Notepad just to prove that this is in, where is it? Main.c. Just to prove it is in fact something you can write in Notepad. I'll just drag this over here. So that's Notepad. You can see it's literally just plain text. And it's it's quite an important thing to remember. This is notation for you, the programmer, not something the computer understands. Um, and basically, this program that I've written is called Hello World. It's every programming language. When you first start it, you have an example Hello World program. And all it's supposed to do is when you compile and run your program, it just spits back at you some text saying Hello World. And you can check. It's just there to check that everything works um, and that you've got some of the basic concepts working. So this is like your litmus test to make sure you've got everything set up properly is to write hello world the program um, i should actually mention now is probably a good time to do it there is a um, if you don't want to install a compiler or if this is just taking too long and you want to have a go right away there is a website so if you google um, for online C compilers, you will find a bunch of them. And the first one that will come up is onlinegdb.com slash online underscore C underscore compiler. And you can see you're presented with the same view here, actually. So this is someone else has ri already written Hello World. You can see it's almost an identical layout to the way I've done it. Um, and this is a text editor. And you can type in whatever you want there and try things out. Um, and then if you hit Run, it will compile your program and run it. And you can see it has a little delay there where it's going compiling. And then it's said at the bottom here, hello world. And um, that's not quite the same text as I wanted. I wanted a comma and I wanted uh, some different things in there. Um, but absolutely, this is a perfect way if you want a really, really quick way to get started and you don't have permission or don't want to mess around with installing compilers and wondering if you've downloaded the right thing and you've got lost somewhere, just go to the website. It's absolutely a fine way to start. <clears throat> and if you're following along and you want to work quickly, this is probably absolutely the quickest way you can go. <clears throat> okay, so I've already got a terminal window open down the bottom here in Visual Studio. Um, if you don't have that open, you can go terminal as a menu up the top and go new terminal. This is kind of why I like it, because it's already there. Um, the other thing you could do is open a terminal separately and go, okay, what is the path to my little folder I made there? I think I have it open over here somewhere. Okay, so, so if I click in the address bar, I should be able to copy and paste that whole path. And then go CD, which is Windows speak for change directory. And then if you right click, it'll paste it in. Um, and then I've gone there and if I go DIR, I can see what's in there and it's got my main.c file and I should be able to type in GCC from here. Um, okay, so I would be able to work like that. Or if I'm within Visual Studio, I have a terminal open down the bottom here. And if I type in GCC down the bottom at the prompt, okay, I get the same stuff. So what you wanna do when you're compiling a program is you type in GCC and if you're on Mac, it'll be Clang instead. So Clang or GCC, 
um, and then the name of your file. And my file, as you'll see over here on the left-hand side, I called it main.c. Um, that's this guy here, if you can see that. <clears throat> okay, and this should build my program. And nothing happened. Um, but I think that means it worked. So if I type in dir again, um, and you can do that. This is a, you can resize these little add-on windows on the bottom here. Um, you can see that actually there's three files in here now. There's the rough plan txt, which has my list of stuff I was going to talk about today. The main.c that we wrote hello world in. And a, another file there that wasn't there before called a.exe. And that is, when you're building code, that is your default name for a program that gets built with GCC or Clang. Um, on uh, Linux, it'll be called a.out instead. On Windows, it's a.exe. Other operating systems don't use the .exe extension. But Windows does. Um, and if you're on Windows, you can just type in a. Uh, actually, you can just type in a. I think it should work. Nope. Okay, so I'm in, I'm in a PowerShell terminal here. So it actually wants to put the path in front. It's actually complaining and telling me at the bottom there. It wants dot for current directories, uh, backslash a, and then it'll work. And you can see it's run my program and printed out hello, comma, space, world, exclamation mark, and then drop down to a new line for the prompt. Um, and that is your official hello world program in C. So if you've got that far, um, you are already programming and um, you're already an entry level programmer and you've written your first program. So that is like a moment that you need to record the date for uh, and celebrate in some way. And um, that is the epoch for you as a programmer. And that's it. So all of the rest of the programming that you'll do stems from this beginning. And actually some really interesting programs are not much more sophisticated than this. Um, so you have some other bits you can now add into them to make them do more interesting things. Uh, but before we do that, and we may not do that in this stream, we may save that for another time. Um, I would like to pick through and explain what all the bits do. <clears throat> so line by line, the first thing you need to understand about a program is that um, there's a fixed entry point. So when your compiler sees your program and is compiling it, it will go looking for what's called a function. And it will look for this keyword that we had to put in there called main. If you don't have that in there, if it's if we just delete that actually, it will complain. And it doesn't know where to start your program. So if I type in GCC again, when will I stream again? I don't have a um, timeline yet. And so I will probably do a poll to see when people would like me to stream again. If this time works for people broadly, I'll do it um, again, possibly even tomorrow. Um, Otherwise, I don't know when, when people are online. Um, I'll find out. And uh, other than that, I'll put stuff on YouTube anyway. Um, it's just nice to have a bit of Q&A so, um, interactively. So I'm, I'm pretty free all the time. So I will do whatever works for people. <clears throat> that broke the compile, but it fixed the mandatory line break at the end of the C source file. Ah, uh, okay, so if you compile something, yeah, that's worth pointing out. Um, if you compile something and your compiler complains and it says, okay, so let's compile again, the same original program we did. But, so you'll see that I have line numbers on the side here that count how many lines are in the file. You don't have that if you've opened it in Notepad, which is why some of these um, developer text editors and development environments are nice to have. They add little stuff like this. Um, so notepad is exactly the same, but you don't see the numbers. So it's actually one, two, three, four, five, six lines, and there's not a blank line at the end. So if I compile this again, there are flags that you can give to the compiler. And a flag is something that's not um, the input file name you're going to give it. It's not the input. It's little bits of extra stuff that you're telling it. I want you to do the same thing, but slightly differently. Um, <clears throat> Have a great evening slash life. Um, I'll, I'll upload this to uh, YouTube so you can check it out later. Um, but I will explain that end of line thing immediately. Um, so if you turn on all the warnings with little flags, which start with a dash, and W all turns on all warnings. So it's saying, GCC, I want you to compile something. But when you do it, have all the warnings on. Um, and I'm going to add in extra warnings. So 
And, and I also want you to be super pedantic and complain about everything. So all the warnings, extra warning, pedantic. And in fact, if you give me a warning, uh, I want you to stop working and report it as an error. So delete errors. This is all the warnings are now turned on. So you should actually do this when you're building a program. Um, I'm going to turn on all your compiler's warnings. Um, find out how for each compiler. Um, whoops. So this is how you do it for GCC. And if I give it my file name again after that, main.c, it's worked fine. Um, if I do it with Clang, though, I think it's going to complain that there's no blank line at the end of the file. Um, I don't have Clang installed on Windows, I don't think. No. Um, so you may have to drop down and leave a blank line at the end and save it and do it again. And some compilers, uh, I think Mac OS Clang is really picky about this. Um, and then it will compile fine. So that's what it's complaining about. I have no idea why this is important or why they can't just automatically do it. You can usually set up your development environment or your text editor to add in a blank line when you save the file if it doesn't have one. So somewhere deep in the preferences here, there's probably a setting there to add in an empty line at the end. <clears throat> okay, so that is um, turning on the warnings. Uh, and that's really helpful to help you find any little mistakes that normally uh, it wouldn't complain about, but could be a bug. Okay, so I haven't got that far yet, um, Sniper Hawk Eye. So um, where I wanted to start was if we get rid of main entirely. So if we got rid of that and then tried to compile it, it's saying, ah, oh, it's got all sorts of errors printing out. So uh, what it's saying here is error in this file, main.c, on line three uh, and uh, column 11 across. So line three and then column 11 across is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. It's finding H and it's going, oh, this a string constant, whatever that is. Uh, and it's pointing actually down here to exactly where it's complaining. Um, this is the format that error messages take from a compiler. They all look a bit like this. And then sometimes you can click on them. I don't know why that's not working now. And it'll jump to exactly your line in the file for you. Um, I don't think it lets me at this this version of Visual Studio Code for some reason. And it's found another one down here on line four, uh, expected identifier. So it's not telling you what the problem is. What the problem actually is, is that it cannot find main. Um, or at least it will not work until you do that. So even if you were able to fix those things, it would still not work because you do not have this entry point called main. <clears throat> So main is a function, and um, functions contain code. So this is not actually a line of code that does anything. It just sa it's saying to um, when you build your program, it's saying this is the lines after this is where you should start executing code. So actually, the first instruction that does anything is this one here. So when you compile it, it'll say the entry point starts after wherever this is, uh, and it'll start actually here. This is the first thing that happens. Um, and it's saying print f, and you'll see there's lots of brackets and things here. There's a very special format for how these things happen, um, and these are called functions. So main is a function, and print f is a function, and functions contain code. Um, we'll come back to that shortly, but this is the first line that executes print f, um, and when you're writing a computer program, um, a really important thing to remember is that there is a thing called control flow um, where it starts at the top and works line by line by line until you get to the bottom. So there's nothing fancy here. What's actually happening is when you run your program, it looks for main, it starts after where main is. This is the first line that executes. Then it will, when it's executed this and printed, hello world to our terminal, it will come down to the next line and it'll process this instruction. Um, if we had further lines here, so I'll just copy and paste that a few times and then maybe we change it a bit. Hello uh, slash life. Uh, hello var style. Uh, hello time alone. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, these are people commenting on chat that I'm just putting the usernames in. Uh, hello, there will be memes. Uh, okay, so if I compile that, 
I'll leave all the warning flags on. Um, just get rid of that little message so you can see there. And then run it again. And I just, I, what I did there was I typed in the letter A and I pressed tab and the terminal auto completed that to the correct format. <clears throat> Um, and you'll see it's printed all of those things out and it's done them one at a time in order. So you've got your entry point main, uh, you proceed to the first line. So hello comma world is printed out, then the line below it, then the line below that, then the line below that, then, and you can see this, this really rigorous order to how things work when you're programming. Um, and that's a fundamental concept. So that's called control flow. Start at the top line, work one line at a time towards the bottom. <clears throat> okay, so um, once we've completed these, we get to this funny looking instruction at the end here. So each line I've got here is actually, it's called an instruction. Um, and you'll see that each line that actually does something in instruction ends with this semicolon character. That denotes where the end is. It just so happens I've put one on every line. You don't need to do that. If you wanted to, you could mix and match a bit. Um, this is just for my benefit. It's nice to see that there's one per actual line on the page. But as far as your compiler is concerned, the lines end in these things. So it doesn't matter what you put in between in terms of line breaks and spaces and tabs. It doesn't do anything. Um, so if I compile it again, it should do the same thing, right? So when I say the control flow is one line at a time, what it really means is one of these instructions up to the next semicolon. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just fix that up a bit because that is quite confusing to read in that manner. So having a nice structure or style to your code can help you follow what's going on so you don't get too confused. <clears throat> Okay, um, the next thing I wanted to come up to is there's this funny little thing at the end here. So what's going on with this? What's going on with this starting formatting stuff? Um, we have a rough idea what these things do. They print stuff out. Um, whatever is in between the quotation marks gets printed out. There's some funny little characters in here. Um, <clears throat> maybe we'll start with the strings. These are called inside the quotation marks first. Um, what does this character slash n at the end do? Um, so this two characters together uh, is a new line command. So it's pretty obvious to see what these individual characters in between the quotes do, and we can change it to different characters with someone else's name or username, um, and that's fine. And we can get rid of the comma. That's pretty straightforward. But what does this thing do? And in fact, what if we copy pasted that um, and it's important to note that these come as a pair. So it's a slash, which indicates it's a special character following the slash. So a slash on its own is going to confuse it. A slash with an N means that, hey, I want a new line there. So I'm going to replace that space that was there with a slash N, and then we'll do it again. Okay, so within a formatted string, as uh, the kind that you give to printf, um, having a slash N a back slash n because it's leaning backwards. Um, if you imagine the feet at the bottom um, and the, the uh, top, it's leaning to the left. So it's leaning back from the direction the text is usually following left to right. So it's a backslash n. Um, that means do a new line. And you can see it's done down here. Hello, instead of space is now drop down a line. So you can do interesting things with that. So that's a special character. And there are a list of those um, <clears throat> that you can look up at some point. Um, and I'll show you how. Um, but what I wanted to get to at the end here, we have a return zero semicolon. What does that mean? So actually this whole construction here is something called a function in C. So function and a function has a special format. And the only function you need when you're starting is a function called main. Um, and that is a function you must have. So you must have a function called main and they have a return type. Uh, space and then a function name. So I'm just writing the formatting here. This is not actual code. And then open parentheses and then arguments to the function, which you might see later. And then open a curly brace. And you can do that 
there on the same line or you can drop it down there so that they line up on the left hand column up to you doesn't matter um, and then inside here is all the code that actually executes when the function starts so a function is a collection of instructions and inside the function you have a control flow when that function is executed the things at the top go line by line by line by line until the end of the function and then at the very end here we have a, a built-in keyword called return and return is saying finish the function and by the way if whatever was calling this function wherever this function was executed from and in our case it's from the terminal where we started our program return a value and we're giving it this mysterious value of zero and in the terminal world if a program runs and returns the value zero it means there wasn't an error everything was fine nothing bad happened when you ran it there were no bugs or anything if you give it a different value um, it will expect it will say it's indicating to whatever called this program or wherever you ran this program from that there was some sort of error and if you want to you can create a little thing in your terminal that will check for an error and do something special um, but most of the time nothing will happen it doesn't matter um, so you have to have this format for a function in c there has to be a return type there has to be uh, a function name you have to ha open and close these parentheses we don't have any arguments to the function yet we might come back to what that means later um, but for right now we have a function name main uh, we know what this these things are just mandatory at the moment they're not necessary um, functionally but you have to have this formatting you have to have uh, open brace that says this is where the function starts and a closed brace that says this is where the function is ended and you'll notice that everything inside those braces has been indented into spaces from the side um, you can use a tab you can use two spaces it's a nice stylistic thing um, to have all of your functions inside braces just indented one level um, and if you had more you could indent them other levels but right now we just have one and um, so it doesn't actually matter it doesn't do anything if you had your text formatted like this in your code <clears throat> it would still work the same it's just a nice on the eye so you can see ah okay if they're indented one level and what i did there was i just selected everything and pressed tab to indent it one level and shift tab to bring it back one level and code editors specific code text editors will have that kind of stuff built into them um, <clears throat> but it doesn't matter it's just a style layout thing um, your, your compiler really only cares about this stuff and where the semicolons end. It doesn't care about any of what you call white space, your spaces, tabs, new lines. You can split it up like this. doesn't matter. <clears throat> okay, so the bit I'm missing there is the return type. And we have a return type here called int. And what's that saying is that this function will operate, do stuff within these brackets in order, in sequence, one after the other. And then when it finishes, it will return a value. And we know that we're either returning zero or one or something else. Zero means everything was fine. One means there was an error. Two means there was an error of a different type, perhaps. Doesn't matter. Um, and those are integers. So uh, if you recall, the integers from mathematics are and I think zero, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So all the kind of natural numbers as well as negative numbers. So minus one, uh, minus two, minus three. And so if you're representing these kind of whole numbers, that's an integer. And what it's saying is that this function will run, do some stuff, and then return a value. And the type of that value is one of these sort of numbers. Um, and ours are going to be zero, 0 or 1. If you really wanted to, you could return minus 1, and maybe that means something to you. Um, for us, it doesn't matter. Does that make sense to everyone so far that's listening, actually? I know I'm a little bit rambly today. <clears throat> so the C language has um, built-in types, and int is one of those types. So int is an integer. Right? It can be other things, but main has to have int main. It has to be that format. If you put anything else there, the compiler might let you get away with it, but it probably will give you a warning. Um, don't do this again. No, it'll probably say, hey, this isn't correct. This is not a correct C program. I'll let you compile. I'll run it as, as I think it's supposed to work, but you should really have int there. Um, <clears throat> you have other types. You have the void type, which means... So it probably will compile if I put void there and don't return anything. Void means there's nothing happening. So if I compile that, yeah. So it's actually complaining. It's giving me that error. Return type of main is not int, and it's supposed to be int. 
Um, if I don't return anything and it's expecting me to return an int, it's probably going to complain about that. It doesn't, which is not very helpful. Um, so you, you really are supposed to return something there. Uh, otherwise, who knows what will happen. Um, <clears throat> so you get these things, uh, undefined behavior or other issues like that, where you can't predict what's going to happen. If you don't ask, explicitly say return the value zero, anything could be returned. Something will definitely be returned. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, int, uh, so we've got the types are void, which means do nothing. And actually, because we're not giving it an argument in here, we could have put void in there just as a placeholder to say, I'm definitely not giving you any arguments. And that's, it's fine with that. So void is one of those types. Uh, yeah, so if you don't have all those warnings on, let's try that again, actually, and get rid of the int. We'll put void and see what happens. Um, I didn't complain, and it will run it, I think, yeah. So it's not correct. It allowed us to get away with it. If we turn all the warnings on, it'll say, hey, this is probably not working the way you expect it's going to work. Um, OK. So turn all the warnings on if you can. Um, what else can we do here? So uh, return types. OK, so we've got void, uh, no type. Um, we can call that a placeholder. And we've got int, the integers. Um, we have float which is uh, a type we can come to later. We won't get into that now because it's quite complex. Um, so that's, uh, we're going to call them decimal point numbers or fractions. Uh, but they're actually called in computer land, they're called floating point numbers. <clears throat> uh, floating point numbers. <sighs> you, th those are your kind of basic types in C. Um, you have in uh, newer versions of C++, you have a type called bool, which is a Boolean types, um, which is from Boolean algebra. And this is true or false. And literally, you would put the word true or false to indicate the value of a Boolean type. Um, you have a double, which is a, a, a double precision floating point number. You won't need any of this for some time. Uh, and there's a simpler type than an int. There is a character or a char, a character. And each character is one byte large. Um, so if we look at our, our text up here, actually every one of these values here inside these quotes, not including the quotes, the quotes are just a formatting thing. They're not part of the string itself, uh, of the letters. Um, you see, it doesn't print the quotes there down the bottom, and they're just saying, "Hey, there's some text in between." And you've got these individual characters. Each one of these is a char. <clears throat> so we can say, uh, "I'll come back to that later." I don't want to do variables yet. Um, so a char is one byte. So actually, each one of these is in fact a char type. So you have a run or a series of these characters um, forming this. Uh, construction here inside the quotes, and that's called a string in C. Um, right, so a series of characters is called a string. <clears throat> okay, I think I've, that's kind of covers a lot of stuff there. Those are all your basic data types. I think I don't think I've missed anything. Um, so C is quite simple. There's not much stuff there to remember. Um, you won't need doubles. You won't need floats very often. Most of the things you will do will be integers, chars. Uh, maybe you'll use void as a placeholder in places like that, just to say there's nothing here. Um, and Boolean will probably come to you at some point later. Um, OK, we've been running for an hour, so I don't want to do too much more today. Um, there's lots of stuff I've kind of held myself back from doing. Um, other things you can do. Obviously, what I've typed in here is just English text. C does have different precision levels for different things, but I won't get into that now. Um, I'm just responding to a, a comment there from there will be memes. So the other thing you might want to do is, hey, I actually quite like having this text here as a reminder of what I can do, but I don't want the compiler to see it because it'll complain. So if I try and compile that now, it'll say, ah, oh, what is this on line 18? It says, line 18, error, expected 
to some kind of bracket before any of this stuff. What's going on with that? It's subtracting something, is it? It doesn't know. So what, what you can do is create what's called a comment to keep the text in the file, but tell the compiler, just please just ignore this. This is just for me, not for you. So a comment starts with a forward slash and then a star or an asterisk. And that you can see it's changed the color to green there because it knows I'm starting a comment. And everything in between this and where I'm going to close that, which is the kind of opposite, which is asterisk and then another forward slash, that is a comment. So now all of the stuff in between here is going to be ignored by the compiler. And you can write yourself little reminders and notes in comments. So you can say um, things like this. So we'll do one up here on one line. Uh, these uh, people were on the stream. Okay, so that's a comment. And now if I compile that, your compiler is absolutely fine. It's not even going to look at the stuff in there. Removed. So, okay, that's perfect. And we can run our program and nothing crazy happens. It doesn't try and print that stuff out or anything. Um, okay, um, in newer versions of C, and this was uh, one of the reasons people moved from C to um, a language called C++, which is C with a little bit extra, is what plus plus means, um, is it people found this kind of stuff a bit clunky. If I just want to do a comment on one line and I'm opening this thing, why do I have to do a closing thing there? It'd be nice if there was a one line version, and actually there is. Um, and so in older C, this didn't exist. So in 1989C, which is sometimes called NCC, the standard C. Uh, this is a, a, a single line comment are available in newer versions of C, but were originally a C++ thing. So you can see I don't have to close that there. I've just gone slash slash. If I have another line of stuff, you can see it's it, knows that it's not part of the comment, so it hasn't made it green. Um, so this really only works for things that are on a single line. <clears throat> and if I compile that again, again, it's ignored that single line comment. That's perfect. So this is a nice way of writing yourself a quick one-liner reminder. These things are for larger blocks. Um, <clears throat> OK, so there's one thing I haven't talked about. Well, there's two things I haven't talked about yet. What printf actually means and what all of this formatting is all about. Um, and I'll come back to the in a second. Um, the other thing is this line right up the top where it's saying hash include or pound include open brackets and there's a thing inside there and it looks like a file name. Um, it's something dot something, right? It looks like a file name. And in fact, it is a file name. Um, and that is a one of the, so the, the programming language as many, with C as many other programming languages, they ship with a set of what are called standard libraries and libraries are little reusable chunks of code that you might want to have in another program um, and standard libraries have little useful utilities like this little function here and actually it's like oh i can see this kind of looks like main it's got the same it's got a name it's got an open thing it's got a closed thing it kind of looks like the way that the main function started here so actually printf is a function and printf comes from this other file and that is, in fact, a file. So STDI is a file. Oops. Um, the standard input output. That's what IO stands for there, uh, library. Um, and printf and the printf function comes from here. So if actually I comment this out and then try and compile it, I think it's going to complain that it doesn't know what printf is, and it does. Okay, so that is not built into the C language. Some of the stuff is built in. You don't need to include things to get the types, um, the main function, uh, the return keyword. There's a special keyword that's built in. So you can't call anything return. Um, returns a built-in keyword. You can't call anything int because that is a built-in keyword for one of the data types um, that's used by the language. And these are all built-in, but printf is not. Printf is a function from the standard libraries. Um, and, to, and to get hold of printf, you've got to include stdio.h. Um, and uh, if you want to find out about things like that, um, a nice way to do that is if you've got, if you're on Linux, actually, the easiest thing to do, or on Mac, is open your terminal, 
Uh, and there's a program called MAN, M-A-N. Um, and if you type in MAN space and then three, and three indicates give me the man short for manual or manual pages and it's saying give me the manual page and i specifically want category three and category three is programming manual pages so things that are functions and programs um and i want to know about printf because it's one of the standard c functions um and it will tell you it so remember that linux is derived from unix and C is the language of Unix, so it's going to have all of the C functions. It probably isn't going to have anything from C++ in there, because um, that is not the standard Unix programming language. C is. Um, so it's it's opened up a little uh, terminal window. This is a program, um, and it's the Linux programmer's manual, and it's the manual page, the man page for printf. And it's also the same page for all these other functions it's listed here f printf which is printing to a file d printf s printf sn there's a whole lot of them there and they're sharing the same page with printf and you can see there's a list of them here up the top uh, and all of the, if your function that you're interested in is any one of these ones it's included in this header file here stdio.h so the dot h stands for a header and a header is a list of stuff and it's saying um, your program, if you find, if anything is in this header file that we've included in our code, so what include does is actually goes away and copies the contents of that file and pastes them into the top of your file. So when you compile it, it has a list of all these functions you can use. Um, oh, I lost my phone. <clears throat> so it will also have fprintf, dprintf, sprintf, snprintf. So if we wanted to use any of those, we could now. Um, because actually when we compile it, there is a thing called the preprocessor that anytime it goes and sees this uh, hash symbol or pound symbol, this, this is not part of the C language. So anything that starts with this is not actually C. It's a hint to the preprocessor that, hey, before you compile it, there's a stage that happens before it compiles that it will run away and do some little task for you. And what I've told it to do is include this other file. And actually we might be able to find that file. So if we go to our mingw folder and we go to include subdirectory, I think we might find one, perhaps not. Um, so it, it might well be in the, the Windows subdirectory somewhere. It's probably using Windows as one. Maybe we can find it here if we go stdio.h. Oh, it was, it was under C++, okay. And I might drag that in over here. So this is the actual file. It's gone with a preprocessor has gone and found this file and copied the contents of this. And this has in turn included this. Okay, it's not particularly helpful. Um, I might be heading on a bit of a wild goose chase with this, but eventually we're going to find a file that has printf in it. Okay, so it has some stuff in it. This is C++ headers, so they're a little bit different. Um, but anyway, there is a file somewhere in your system that will have a list of these functions you can use in your code. Um, and if you want to find out how to use them, your man page is a great reference for that. So it's telling you, hey, printf is a function. It has a return type that also returns an integer. What, is, what does that mean, actually? We didn't do anything with the return type. Um, you can find out in here. And if you press space, you can scroll down. Uh, or use the cursor keys and you can read a description of how you're supposed to use it what it does um what all the little uh characters mean in there so it's somewhere down here it is going to have slash n this is quite a lengthy document uh, i think you can actually search like this yeah okay so uh, the other thing you can do if you're not on a Unix system is go and Google it. So if you Google man page printf or man printf, you will find something similar. And maybe this is a bit more readable in a web page. Exactly the same information. Um, so this is actually a bit easier to scroll through. And if I search for slash n, is that the first reference to it? Maybe it is. It's not very verbose, is it? Okay, so that, I mean, the line feed character um, slash n, it should really have a description of that in here somewhere. But maybe printf is not a good example. Um, 
Okay, so maybe I can explain that myself. So oh, what we can see from that, though, is... So print F, it's telling you it is accepting some, and these things inside the curly, uh, inside the uh, parentheses are called parameters, a list of parameters. Um, so it's saying it expects, and there's our char, which is one of our types, right? So we had a char, a character, one byte, a series of these things is called a string of characters. Um, so we have more than one character in our string. I'm sorry, slash life, I don't know what that comment was in reference to. It is stored as a single character, even in the character literal. Um, so it's taking, what it's doing there is it's saying, <clears throat> um, and I won't explain the const keyword just now, but it's saying, okay, I'm, I'm gonna take char, but this little star here is indicating I'm going to point to a series of chars. It can be one, it could be many, you tell me. Um, and when you give it a string, that's, um, you know what we can do? We can copy paste that. Um, but it's saying, I'm going to give me a formatted series of characters or these char data types. Uh, and then a comma, and then dot, dot, dot. And that's what that means is um, you can do interesting stuff in here. So um, with formatted strings in C, um, you can actually print values out as well. And if you were to print values, so not just the names, but maybe some numbers and things, uh, we might come back to that possibly in another stream. Um, you can do really interesting stuff with printf. Um, but maybe what I can do is do exactly what it said there. Const char format, I'm going to call it something else. Formatted string equals, who was it that didn't get said hello to? Um, Hanks. Okay, semicolon. So what I'm doing there is I'm, this is a new concept. I'm creating a variable and a variable uh, there is exactly what the manual was looking for. This is a little bit complicated for a start. Um, and I've given it a name and I'm gonna print that. And this is, don't worry about doing this yet. Um, this is more of an advanced thing we can come back to later. Um, but this is interesting stuff you can do with printf. So I'm not typing in a string. I'm saying, hey, refer to this other variable that contains a string. And it's in a, a series of these chars. Um, you could do stuff like that. So it's saying there, hello, Hanks, at the start. Um, <clears throat> do not worry about that yet. That's more interesting stuff you can do later. Um, but when you begin with, uh, when you're beginning, as long as you can install a compiler and understand that key concept that you're writing a specific set of instructions, start at the bottom of main, uh, top of main, work one instruction at a time to the end of main, um, and that you have this idea that this is just a text file, and uh, you can save that, and then a compiler, which is another program, and I've used GCC, will build that into an executable program. Um, and I would start with that, play around a bit, see if you can put other things in the text. Um, don't worry about variables and pointers and things yet. Um, and then you have a concept here called a preprocessor, um, and it goes away and there's a set of these standard libraries you can use in C, and lots of languages have this. And I'm using the standard input output library because it gives this um, function that lets me print to the console called printf. And printf means print formatted. Um, and it's a formatted series of characters, and a series of characters or chars is um, a string. It's called a string. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, okay, another interesting thing you can do is that the formatting for these individual characters, um, and slash slash is making a comment there about this slash n here. Um, this, these are all from a set of, so in the 1970s when C was created, um, everyone expected that the entire world was only going to speak American English, um, <clears throat> which means that you have a very limited set of characters you can use. Um, you cannot, for example, use um, German characters with an umlaut on them. You can't use Japanese um, or Chinese characters. It's not going to work. It's only going to uh, use a subset of very, very simple American English letters. 
I think this is a major oversight. Um, and they're from a set called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Um, and it was a very, very limited basic set of characters. And if I go to my Linux machine, there is a program called ASCII, which I have not installed, but it's telling me I can. And if I run that, it's going to print the whole set. So you can see all the things you're allowed to put in C in a string. Now that's it. There's a very small set, and each one of them has a code. So there's a, a bunch of these things, null, SOH, ETX. These are control codes and special codes for different things. Your actual letters of the alphabet um, start around here. You have a space, actually, um, and it has decimal value 32. Um, so there's only a byte's worth or half a byte's worth of stuff here. So you have from code 32 up to code 126, you have printable stuff and you have some exclamation points and punctuation in the first column there. Um, you have the numbers starting in the next column with some more punctuation. And so the, the actual character representing the, 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 well, the letter really zero, not the value zero, the letter zero has this value of 48. Um, so when you store it in a character, these are all stored as numbers. Um, one, one byte can store up to, uh, or 0 to 255 are the values it can have. So that doesn't give us a lot of letters we can use. Um, and we've got half of that space used up for this very, very small subset of letters. We've got basically the Sesame Street version of the English alphabet here, and that's about it. Um, there's nothing from other languages. Even all English letters aren't in here. Um, and very, very basic. So that's OK for starting off. Um, Yeah, newer, newer languages um, have better systems um, than ASCII. They have a system called Unicode, which has a much wider range of characters. And that's if you want to, if you're on the web and you can see Chinese or Japanese um, ideograms or characters or glyphs displayed, they're probably using a system called Unicode instead of ASCII. Um, <clears throat> but with C, with basic C functions like printf, you can only use ASCII characters. So you can look up a table of those on the web as well. But I just thought it was cool that there was a program that lists them all. Um, so those are the only things you could put in there. Otherwise, it'll wacky things will happen. It may work by accident. It may not work at all. Uh, it may print the wrong thing. And each one of these values, these characters, is one byte, one byte large. Uh, and that is because it has a numerical value um, represented by the decimal column you might find most natural in this table. Um, and that's it. So you don't have a lot in there. And the slash n combination on the end actually is one of these. Um, <clears throat> and actually, uh, we might print a thing here. So you can print more than just strings. You can print values as well. So maybe we'll say, OK, the value of the letter h of the capital letter H is, and then I'm going to use a special printf formatting thing, which is percentage i, which is I'm go I want you to print an integer here. This is a placeholder. Um, slash n, which is one character by itself, and then comma, which is something we saw on the man page for printf. So where it's seen a placeholder after the comma, it's going to look for the thing we want to print, and I'm going to actually put single quote, meaning not a string, but just the one character on its own, h semicolon. So at the end, if we compile that again and run it, at the very end, it's going to say the value of the capital letter h is 72. So if we, I went back to my table of ASCII characters here, ah, what have I done? Scrolled too far and look for the letter capital letter h. It has there the decimal value of 72. Um, so each one of these things um, is a, a byte's worth of information, and it has values between this range of values here up to 126. So the interesting thing here is, um, as someone was mentioning in the chat, the value of the slash n control code, which means line feed, um, drop to the next line, is, and then I'm going to go slash n. Again, that is a single character, it's not two characters. It is on, printed on the screen in the text file. It's two separate characters. But when you compile it, it's considered one 
<clears throat> and it only takes up one byte. So it's a pair of things that represents one thing. Uh, and when I print it, oh, whoops. It's actually done a line break um, because slash n is valid. If you do slash slash, I think it'll print slash n in the printout. You'll see it's actually not printed out slash n. It's actually dropped down a line because it's still respecting that control code. Um, but now it's printed it out because I've escaped the slash character by doing slash slash instead of slash. So it's no longer slash n. It's now a slash and an n. Um, very confusing. Uh, don't worry too much about that. Um, but what it's done is it's gone the value of the letter and then whatever I've told it to print there. Okay, I'm going to go the value of, let's get rid of that actually, the value of the line feed um, byte, a B-Y-T-E byte is, and then placeholder for an integer, uh, and then at the end I'm going to feed it those two characters, the, those two um, characters in the text file that are actually one character in the string. And it said the value of that byte is 10. So if I go and look up, okay, what's number 10 in my table here? Da, 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 and it has LF. And it doesn't have anything printed there. It has LF and that stands for line feed. Okay, so quite right. It is one character that fits in one byte. And it's part of a string. It's not a, a um, special printf thing. You can have that in any string. Um, but these ones here, starting with the percentage symbol, are special printf formatting placeholders. OK, I think anyway, that's like enough uh, to start with. Um, so when you're building things, the, the last thing I was talking about there is you have a preprocessor. And that happens before the compiler kicks in. And it does some little substitutions for you. So you can have it um, look for a certain uh, symbol or a word in your file and replace it with something else everywhere in the file. And that will happen before uh, the compiler kicks in. Um, and, but in this case, it's pulling up that standard her header file, which I couldn't quite find. Um, and <clears throat> it will contain all the stuff we need so that we can use printf, um, which is a function from that standard library. The dot h is a indicates it's a file, and c has this concept of things called header files, and they are a little, they're essentially a heads up to say, hey, I'm going to give you the ability to use this list of stuff. So that's a header file. We might wait, if we do another c programming thing, we'll make header files later. Um, but for, for now, that's all it is. It's a, a file with a list of stuff you can use. Um, and it'll the compiler will be happy with that. And then you can use printf. <clears throat> OK, um, is everyone happy with that so far? I was a little bit tired today, and I haven't streamed for ages. So I know it's a little clunky, and I made a few mistakes. So I hope that's all right. But um, if you followed along, and you've been able to download any sort of compiler and do anything at all, and put in a hello world program, you have absolutely started off on the right path. And I think if we do another session, we can look at more interesting stuff you can do when you make programs like, hey, how do I do loops? How do I do printing more interesting things? How do, what are variables? How do I do calculations with a program? How do I write an image out? Stuff like that. We can look at that later if you like. <clears throat> I don't have a schedule yet. Um, so if, if people are interested, if this is actually valuable for people or keeps you entertained at least while you're stuck at home, um, we can make one. I think that's a good idea. Um, so I don't know if the, a poll or something like that is a good idea. Um, I think Twitter polls are kind of crappy. So I'll um, maybe a, is there a Google thing that does a nice poll? I don't know. I'll have a look and I'll see if people are interested and then what topics are interesting for people. <clears throat> Um, yeah, we have plenty of time now, so I think that kind of concludes the little interactive thing. I've gone way beyond Hello World with funny little things. Um, don't get overwhelmed by all the little extra bits I did. If you can do Hello World, if you can play around and modify it a bit and see if you can break it, um, if you can compile it with anything at all, including the online thing, absolutely fine. Um, and then try and do some comments. I think that's enough. And, and then if we want to do something more interesting, we can move on to that on another stream. <clears throat> Okay, so do yourself a favor and do not 
turn on all warnings uh, from Slashwise. The shown wall extra pedantic is a sane starting point while wearer, so warnings as errors is W error, make sure you actually deal with the warnings before continuing. There are a lot of additional warnings you need to enable on a one by one basis, some of which will generate a lot of warnings you usually do not care about for good reasons. W conversion to name a notorious one. Um, yeah, I think that's fair enough. And um, when you're starting, it is enough that you see the warnings. You don't need to force yourself to not continue until you fix them. So I had where on to stop everything compiling if there was any warning. It would say error, and I'm stopping. I'm not building your program. It is actually perfectly fine to have um, actually just W A L L capital W A L L turn on all warnings is certainly fine when you're starting. Um, that will print out any funny little issues that you should know about when you're learning, that's fine. And then if you see a warning, just make sure you do try and fix it. Um, see if you can find out what it's trying to tell you. As you can see from earlier, it doesn't always tell you what the problem is. It tells you what a variety of things that it thinks are various problems in no particular order. Um, so you do have to use a bit of intuition to understand what the real issue is. Um, do try and solve those warnings. Um, don't get into the habit of leaving your program with warnings and things um, and then never fixing them as a lot of programmers do. Um, so if you need to force yourself, turn on W error. If you don't need to, just definitely look for them. Um, turn them all on so you can see what they all are. Um, if you're on Visual Studio, don't worry too much because they have a excessive numbers of warnings about everything. Um, so I wouldn't worry so much there. The defaults for Visual Studio are pretty good. But if you're using Clang or GCC, Clang should be the same. Uh, oh, actually, I've got it installed on my little Linux there. So if I go Clang wall, um, that has the same format as GCC. So that should work too. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's absolutely fair enough. You don't need to turn absolutely everything on and force yourself to fix them. <clears throat> And did people following that haven't programmed before, was that kind of okay? Is there anyone there on the stream that's never programmed anything before and was that all right? Or do you, are you absolutely bamboozled by what's going on? <clears throat> or is there anyone that has programmed before but this is the first time you've seen C and is there anything that I need to clarify there? <clears throat> Nope, I think that's that's probably about it, is it? Looks good to me, Super Megabyte, okay. Um, so we did Hello World, and we did what a function is, very kind of roughly, have an idea of a function. <clears throat> Turns out it's a veterans meeting. Yeah, I think there's a few people that have been doing this for a long time. Um, thank you for the advice. Um, yeah, I, I think for me the important concepts are um, you have a built-in function, that's your entry point, and you have a control flow where you start at the top line and work your way one line at a time or one instruction at a time towards the end of the function. <clears throat> and you have a compiler. So C is what you call a compiled programming language. So it doesn't just work. You've got to give it to another program first and it builds your program. Okay, great. I know I almost went on a couple of really confusing tangents there. So I'm, I'm glad that was... That was all right for people. I kind of had to stop myself. Um, yeah, so if, if this is like a topic that's interesting to people, or if you'd like me to do an intro to another programming language, or just do this again, but better, I can do any of those sort of things. But um, the interesting thing that uh, I think most people wanted me to do was I mostly do 3D graphics programming. Um, and I think there were a lot of people interested in doing a, hey, help me get started with OpenGL. So do a startup of OpenGL. How do you draw a triangle and set up all the little bits and pieces to get it working? Um, which is a little bit of a jump from starting programming at all. So if you've got reasonable C++ or C or C Sharp or another language um, skills, it'll be fine. But if you've never programmed before, we'd need to do some more stuff. Um, but I think most of the people I asked really wanted an OpenGL starter. So we could do that as well. <clears throat> Thank you.
Um, if you've never programmed, it might be interesting just to watch, even if you don't know everything that's going on. So I could be right. Help, help me set up Vulcan ray tracing. I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, so Vulcan's another 3D graphics API. is an application programmer interface, which is essentially a little library, or, well, a big library that, um, like the way we got printf here, it'll give you a set of functions and things for starting um, talking to the graphics card on your computer and doing cool 3D graphics that are really fast. <clears throat> Um, I can give you a, so Sniper Hawkeye says, would be interested in learning more about the differences between C and C++ and which is better in which situation uh, in future, if you'd be up for it. I can talk a little bit about that now since we're in kind of extra time. Um, okay, so C and C++, I think if you'll give me one moment, I'll be back in like less than a minute. Okay, so the core thing you need to understand about the C programming language is this is the entire user manual for everything that is in the C programming language. It's about 200 pages long. It's called the C programming language. Can you see that? Second edition is the one you want. Um, and it says ANSI C on the front there somewhere. And that was like, ANSI means like the current standard C. Um, and people kind of misuse it to refer to the older version of C, which was at one time the standard um, C, but Oh, it's okay. That's not a big deal. But anyway, um, the program C programming language is by Brian Kernahan and Dennis Ritchie, um, who are foundational people from Bell Labs that did the Unix operating system um, and were instrumental in many other um, really important um, computer science advances, um, including the Go programming language, which I was looking at recently. This is the whole book. So if you want to learn C, it's the stuff I've been doing plus a whole lot more. Um, and it will take you, it's got little examples, and if you've got your compiler working, you can absolutely do more of these little examples and make a set of things to try. And I would do one program after another, make a little set of folders. Today I'm going to try this feature, and tomorrow I'm going to try that feature. You could work through this in a day or two, and you would know everything that there is to know about the C programming language. It is not a lot of information. And that is why I like using C. It's because it's simple. There's not a lot in it. Um, so there's actually not a lot more in C in total than what we've done already today. Um, and I would say that is a very important distinction to make between C and any other programming language, particularly C++. So C++ started as a set of useful little add-on extra helper things to make life easier, like single line comments. But it has grown into a massive, massive language of its own uh, in its own right. So it's almost a completely separate thing now. Um, There's a huge number of people working on it. It's used by a huge number of people. Um, so I would say that is the most important distinction is one is a tiny little programming language and you can learn everything. And one is colossal. Um, so the, a number of books that you could read that are kind of that thick. Um, I, I've been doing C++ for like 16 or 17 years and I would not call myself an expert. Whereas with C, you could definitely call yourself an expert within a year or so. Of, it's not going to take you a year to learn it. It's going to take you under a year to learn the entire thing, plus some practice for a year or two, you're going to be really good. Um, so that is the key difference. One is really, really simple. Um, I, I say the other key difference is where it's used. Um, so C is operating system. So Linux, the biggest operating system, most widely used in the world, is used for everything. That is a C um, set of programs. And the C kernel, the core of the operating system, is, uh, sorry, the Linux kernel is written in C. Um, Unix was written in C. Um, so it is absolutely the language of operating systems. And um, computer systems programmers, large, it's probably still the biggest systems programming language. Um, there are a few of those um, that have different pros and cons. Um, C++ is also a systems programming, programming language. Um, I, I want to say that in another important like kind of usage distinction is like stuff that's really simple like little embedded devices and little chips 
um, to control things. Um, uh, Arduino-based stuff that you're most likely going to be using C on there. It's very easy to get all of that onto a little chip, a little reprogrammable chip. Um, less likely to be using C++. Um, I want to say there's an interesting history to how it's been used in entertainment. So C++ is absolutely used probably the most common for high-performance 3D graphics. I still prefer using C for that, but I think I'm a bit of an oddball there. Um, during the 90s, there was an early 90s, from the 80s to the 90s, there was a transition from using things like basic and assembly language into using C for games. And that kind of held for possibly a decade. And then in the late 90s, and you can see this happen, you can find the source code for popular games that were made then. Um, if you go to look at id software's GitHub repo, um, you can also find, I think, Duke Nukem 3D or the build engine or uh, Blood, any of these kind of 90s um, kind of frontline games. You can find Quake, you can find Doom, they are all C. Um, and at some point at the end of the 90s, um, object-oriented programming and Java became unbelievably popular. And I, the games industry started going, oh, there might be something interesting we could do there and moving into C++. So um, we're still in the kind of legacy of that whole industry shifting to C++. So most graphics and most games people use C++, although the actual interfaces are still mostly targeting C. Um, so if you're doing 3D graphics with OpenGL or with Vulkan or with Direct3D, there are all there are C interfaces for all of those things. And I prefer using C because it's simpler, but everyone else uses C++. So your biggest difference is there's more to learn and some industries prefer one or the other. Are there good reasons or bad reasons for those? Probably. Does it really matter? Probably not so much. Um, but there are definitely trends there into who's using what. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if there's much more I can say of that's that's meaningful on the differences. Um, the early differences are the most notable thing. So I was talking about some simple quality of life stuff like single line comments. They were a C plus plus thing. The bool or the boolean data type was a C plus plus thing. C doesn't have it in the older versions. So if you go and look at the source code for things like Wolfenstein 3D, the game which you can find on GitHub. Um, wherever they wanted a boolean, which is like, is this true or false? They would make, they would home make their own version of um, a a data type for boolean. So every project had its own version of how to set up a yes or no answer. Um, whereas C++ brought in this data type called bool, and it's like, oh, that's kind of standard now. That's nice. Um, so I think those early little quality of life things are important. Um, when the industry got really, really enamored with the whole programming industry with ob a thing called object-oriented programming, C++ was trying to introduce some of those concepts, and I think that was very attractive for people. So um, functionally, it doesn't really make any difference. They're almost identical. Um, you can do all the same things in both languages, really. Um, there are more features in C++, though. <clears throat> I hope that's like a very verbose answer. I hope that's okay. Those are my personal views anyway. If you were to ask a someone else, they might have a completely different answer or a strong opinion. <clears throat> um, oh, one thing that's kind of notable is um, I was working for a company called Dacry that did um, augmented reality headsets. <clears throat> it's very similar to Magic Leap um, and similar to HoloLens. So that, that kind of ballpark stuff. And... Um, we had a lot of C++ code um, across the code base, but the individual little bits and pieces, the libraries that were, were used across things and the low-level system stuff, they were often in C, and it's easier to share C code. So your main program, it's probably C++, because people prefer working in it. It has lots of little bits and pieces that people really like. Um, but it's harder to share it for various reasons. So if you want someone else to use your code in their project, um, it's easier to share a little C library. So a library is like the STD IO that we included. Um, and if you've got a simple little interface to a C library, they tend to be a little bit less friction to share those between teams or between projects. <clears throat> I think that's probably a important actual practical difference. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, yeah, like if you're going down that path, it's probably also worth considering the other C-like languages. So Java is based on, very closely based on C, but with a lot of really strict formatting and object-oriented stuff. Um, and Objective-C is really interesting. It's a mixture of exactly the C language, so you can do exactly the stuff. A completely valid program in Objective-C. This is one of the Apple languages. Um, I think it was like a small talk thing, uh, sorry, a, um, a next step thing originally, perhaps. But um, there was another language called small talk, which was in a pure object oriented, really nicely designed, concise thing. And so they just kind of smushed that into C so you could do both small talk and C. And if you're using Objective C, you can kind of get this feel that you're switching between languages within the same file. Um, really quite odd. Um, but that's Objective C. And that was the standard kind of language for Apple stuff for a long time until they introduced Swift. <clears throat> um, C Sharp, it was a, a, another C derived language that was like originally, I think, Microsoft's answer to Java. Um, so Sun Oracle were the Java um, groups that owned Java. And um, Microsoft wanted their own modern ish, object oriented easy to use um, an enterprise system style language. And so they came up with C-sharp. Um, and that's now been spun off. And it's really interesting to see, because of the ease of use of this stuff, that it's been taken on in completely different places like games. Um, so if you're using Unity 3D to make games, you'll probably be using C-sharp, which is almost identical to C, but it has um, some other concepts in it <clears throat> that are kind of inspired by Java largely, I think, or at least a competitor to Java. <clears throat> J-sharp, yeah, I think J-sharp is like a Java-derived thing, isn't it? <clears throat> I haven't used J-sharp. Yeah, it's a funny name for a language. Um, I don't know why it's C and then sharp, like the musical symbol. They didn't call it pound or hash or something. Yeah, so I, I didn't talk about pointers. I almost kind of went down that rabbit hole and then avoided it at the last minute. But maybe that's another a topic for another time. But I think actually pointers is one of the reasons that people should work with C. It's because, so a pointer is a way to address memory. Um, so if you've got memory on your computer, your RAM, you want to know where stuff is, your data is stored in there. A pointer gives you a way to store the actual place in memory. So each a, a location in memory has something called an address, and it's a number to say where something starts or finishes. Um, and you have to use those with C. Other languages hide that because it's confusing or error prone. Um, but I think it's really good to spend some time doing that because it gets you reasoning about how the actual computer is working underneath. So if you go to another language, and you've still got that in your mind, you kind of can reason about what's really going on underneath. And, and that can give you a bit of an advantage to when you're optimizing things or trying to improve the performance of them. <clears throat> okay, I think um, my brain's kind of slid off today so that might be about all i can do but i'll, I'll try and put this on youtube it's a bit rambly i hope it's helpful for someone um but uh yeah I, hopefully if there's someone that kind of wants to know more and was like oh that's interesting and i kind of got started what do i do next certainly give me a shout an email or a tweet or something and i'll respond to everything that comes up <clears throat> but um yeah i certainly it's it's been weird being isolated in this whole virus thing um with you know very little social contact so it's it's kind of a, i thought it was a nice idea to start if you're not you know in a classroom teaching or something you may as well do something online to have some interaction and share some of the knowledge <clears throat> I need to have a closing jingle and an opening jingle i think maybe someone can compose one for me <clears throat> Okay, until next time, I'll uh, yeah, I'll put a poll up or something to see what people want next. Cool. Well, maybe I can inspire someone else to do something I've never done before and I can learn something too.
Yeah, you're all very, very welcome. It was good fun. I'll, I'll uh, give you my uh, puns next. I haven't had, you know, people, victims to share my endless stream of bad jokes with, so that'll come next time. <laughs> Forty-five minutes to Doom Eternal. So video games tomorrow. Maybe no stream tomorrow. <laughs> I think everyone will be playing video games. <clears throat> cool. Okay. Now I just have to figure out the tiny little button to press so that it actually stops streaming, but saves the recording. Okay, there's two.